This tour to Egypt with NEXT and Adept Expeditions has been a profound experience in my life. NEXT studied with John Anthony West, of course, but has decades of his own research and he brings an independent and unique perspective to all of this. It comes at you like a fire hose of knowledge when you're at these sites. Don't miss it. Hey, what's up everybody? NEXT here with another video. If you are new to this channel, please subscribe now and smash that bell icon for updates on future videos. This is part three in a three-part mini-series exploring interpretations of the so-called Dendara light bulb. Now this subject has been covered here on YouTube before many other videos have covered this, nothing new under the sun, but they give a basic explanation and many fail to reference the accompanying hieroglyphs when offering an interpretation. So. In this video, we are going to go even deeper and get into some of the esoteric aspects, which should give us a better understanding for the ancient point of view and how the people who actually carved this relief may have viewed the world around them. This relief we are looking at is commonly referred to as the Dendera light bulb. It's depicted on the northern wall located inside the subterranean crypt beneath the Hathor temple at Dendera in Egypt. And on the southern wall, we find two of these so-called light bulbs. And it is commonly called this because, well, admittedly, it does look like a light bulb or a cathode ray tube or a crook's tube. It has been made popular and sensationalized by television programs like Ancient Aliens and published in the literature by authors such as Eric Von Donneken in his book, The Eyes of the Sphinx, published back in 1989, where he suggests that the snake represented a filament, the jed pillar was an insulator, and the tube was in fact an ancient electric light bulb. He also suggests that the figure here we see at the end was a baboon, and apparently it was a warning that the device could be dangerous if not used correctly. Now this idea is eerily reminiscent to what we heard in video one of this series from chematologist Stephen Mailer. Hakim said this text means this is a knowledge of ancient technology that can be abused which is according to the uh, so-called indigenous wisdom tradition of ancient Egypt, which allegedly goes back thousands of years and was kept secret in secret circles of initiates, according to the author. Although I haven't come across any compelling evidence to suggest this is actually factual. The idea being perpetuated by the chematologist, according to his teacher, Hakim, is that the text says that this is knowledge of ancient technology that could be abused. However, the first time this idea is documented would rest with Eric Von Donneken and the idea that it was a baboon and apparently a warning that the device could be dangerous if not used correctly. Now, we will go over what the texts actually say later in this video, so you'll want to stick around for that. But the theory of this relief depicting electrical lighting really begins in the ancient astronauts community around 1979, when author Reinhard Hobeck first noticed the relief during a trip to Egypt. He later returned in 1980 with another author, Peter Krasa, who suggested that he write about high technology in Egypt, and together they co-authored the book, translated in English as Light of the Pharaoh, published in 1992. Now the Austrian authors tell us, and I quote, the walls are decorated with human figures next to bulb-like objects, reminiscent of oversized light bulbs. In these bulbs, there are snakes in wavy lines. The snakes pointed tails issue from a lotus flower, which without much imagination can be interpreted as the socket of the bulb, end quote. If this were true, it would imply that the ancient Egyptians had knowledge and perhaps technology long before Benjamin Franklin was first given credit for discovering electricity and therefore before Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison, who both played a key role in the history of electricity. However, what isn't well known is that the discovery of electricity actually goes back more than 2,000 years. In fact, it actually goes back nearly 500 years before the Temple of Dendera was even finished with its construction. 
The earliest building in the entire Dendera temple complex, which spans some 40,000 square meters, isn't even the Hathor temple itself. It's the Mamisi, or birth house, erected by Nictanabo II, who was the last of the native Egyptian pharaohs, and this was around 330 BC. So even though there is evidence that an earlier pharaoh, Pepe, had built on the site around 2250 BC, the Hathor temple, where the so-called Dendera light bulb relief is located, only began construction in the late Ptolemaic period, around 300 BC. But in 600 BC, the ancient Greeks discovered rubbing fur on amber, a fossilized tree resin, caused an attraction between the two. And so it could be argued that it was actually the ancient Greeks who first documented a discovery of static electricity. Interestingly enough, the Temple of Dendera was commissioned by the ancient Greeks who were occupying Egypt during the Ptolemaic period with later additions to the temple by the Romans. So although we refer to it as ancient Egyptian, it's actually a late Ptolemaic dynasty temple built by foreign transplants during a time when the people of Egypt were already losing the ability to embody the doctrine of the ancient ancient Egyptians, such as the pyramid builders and the so-called pharaohs of the Old Kingdom. So it's possible these ancient Egyptians, the Ptolemaic Greeks, did have a working knowledge of static electricity as their ancestors in Greece were already somewhat aware of the science for at least 500 years. But is this really depicting a light bulb or a crook's tube? In video one of this series, chematologist Stephen Mailer described it as a knowledge of ancient technology according to the so-called indigenous wisdom tradition of his teacher, Abdel Hakim Ayawan. In video two, my mentor, John Anthony West, described it as a stage of cosmology. Now, this is the interpretation that I lean more towards, and I'll explain why in a moment. But what I find most remarkable about John Anthony West's explanation is that he intuited this without even having the appropriate context. And by appropriate context, I mean an understanding for what the accompanying hieroglyphs actually say. I have been to Egypt with both Stephen Mailer and John Anthony West, and neither could actually read the hieroglyphs. Stephen Mailer leans on his teacher, Abdel Hakim Ayawan's interpretation, but not even Hakim could read the Ptolemaic hieroglyphs. As I mentioned, this temple was constructed in Ptolemaic times by the Greeks and later Romans. Ptolemaic hieroglyphs are extremely complex, so much so that even most Egyptologists with PhDs who are proficient in reading hieroglyphs struggle to understand them. It often requires a rare Egyptologist who is specialized to read and transliterate the Ptolemaic glyphs. With Ptolemaic hieroglyphs, it requires multiple glyphs to explain what the ancient, ancient Egyptians could express in a single symbol. So it becomes interesting to point out how even without being able to read the accompanying Ptolemaic hieroglyphs, John Anthony West was able to arrive at this interpretation. There can be no doubt that his understanding of ancient ontology and cosmology derives from his acquaintance with the Western esoteric tradition. For the uninitiated, it becomes so important to suspend modern assumptions and perceptions. We have to divorce ourselves from our own ontology, the way we view the world, and really try to think like the ancient Egyptians would have. For example, what we conventionally call the gods of Egypt were actually understood by the ancient Egyptians as energetic principles of nature. So what we may take for a serpent may actually be depicting an aspect of the rising sun. But if we are not versed in Egyptian mythologies, cosmogony, cosmology, and ontology, or proficient in, let's say, Ptolemaic hieroglyphic language, which is the medu Netra language, then we make our own assumptions. This is where I attribute my many years of studying hermetic texts and the understanding for Western esoteric tradition as being a valuable foundation for investigating ancient civilizations. So I will be looking at the reliefs through an esoteric lens and adding my own insights, but I'm also going to give you a translation of the accompanying Ptolemaic hieroglyphs, as well as the Egyptological explanation for what we're really looking at. This is the famous so-called Dandera light bulb. We are now facing north, looking at the northern wall. And this 
is Ihi, a lesser deity, but venerated at Dendara, or Dendera, or Tentra, or Tentris, which is a Greek corruption of the ancient Egyptian Lunet, or Ineta Neder, in the Medu Necher divine language. Dendera was also known as the Castle of the Sistrum, or the Per Hathor, which, or, which is the House of Hathor. And Ihi had his own cult following here. Ihi is he who holds the sistrum, the lord of vibration. He who uses musical instruments to drive away opposing forces, both visible and invisible. You can see he holds a sistrum in his right hand. The sistrum was sort of like a musical rattle used in religious ceremonies and rites of the said festival. In the other hand, he holds the menat necklace, the menat was a counterpoise attached to a pectoral that would drape around the neck or shoulders, but it was also used like a musical instrument and sometimes in tandem with the menat as part of the ancient vibrational science. He was the master of the said festival and he takes on the form of Ra, the great god. He appears with a diadem as a king of Egypt. But why was Ihi so important here at Dendera? Well, he was the son of Heru who the Greeks called Horus of Edfu, and his consort Hetheru, or Hether, or Hathor, to whom this temple is consecrated to. She was the mistress of the cycles of time in her cosmic role as the sacred divine feminine nourishing principle. Dendera was not only consecrated to the Netter Hathor, but also dedicated to the celebration of festivals and secret rites. During a yearly festival, Hathor traveled from Dendera to Edfu, where she met Horus to conceive their child, Ihi, or Harsumthis. In connection with his mother, Hathor, the cow, who is often depicted as a woman with the head of a cow, ears of a cow, or simply in cow form, Ihi is known as the calf. He was the way for those seeking a connection to the goddess or Netter. His cult following believed you had to get intoxicated to connect with the energy of the goddess. And he was the bread, the calf, the calf of music, the calf of beer. Music, intoxication, and vibration served an important role here at Dendera. According to one myth, Ihi sprung into existence out of a lotus flower, which blossomed in the watery abyss of noon at dawn at the beginning of each new year. It is therefore suggested by some that the light bulbs are in fact lotus flower bulbs, mythologically giving birth to the god. Another panel in the crypt shows the bulb opening into a lotus blossom and a snake standing erect in the center as a representation of the god or netter, Ihi, the lord of vibration, first form. On the southern wall of the last room inside the crypt, a falcon preceded by a snake emerges from a lotus blossom within a boat. This is going to become important as we move on. Facing east is Harasemtawe or Harsumthis, Horus, the unifier of two lands. Sumthis was known from the Old Kingdom on, but didn't take a prominent role until the late New Kingdom, where he merges with Horus. Sumthis was a Greek corruption of Harsamatawe, a personification of the sky, the serpent in the sky. There was also Ra Samtawe, a personification of the sun. So, Harsamatawe, personification of the sky, Ra Samatawe, personification of the sun, especially the new rising sun, the snake. And this was the form that was preferred in Dendera as other examples within the temple show the snake as the rising sun. Here we see the serpent rising from the lotus flower, replacing the more common motif of a sun disk rising from the lotus flower. According to myth, Horus took the form of a winged sun disk to protect the solar boat. Here, an aspect of Horus takes the form of a serpent, representing the rising sun on the solar bark, which is the cable in the light bulb theory. As the young child in human form, and as the sun god in serpent form, which is also described as the living Ba in the lotus flower of the day solar bark. The Ba was one of nine aspects of the soul. It is our presence in the world, sort of a personality that transcends temporal life and takes flight into the afterlife. 
it is most commonly depicted as a human-headed bird, thus denoting its volatility and ability to go to and from the earth. In the symbolist approach, anything with wings is usually attributed to the spiritual world, that which can transcend the earthly realm or material plane of existence. In Pythagorean terms, this is the one and the two which comes together to form a third. It is the law of three, or what Rosicrucians refer to as the law of the triangle. This is why you see the two aspects overlapping, with Ihi behind the bulb in an act of creation made manifest. This is two aspects of the same principle happening in tandem. Two aspects emanating from a single source, or in other words, its source experiencing itself through two aspects of the same principle. In this way, the source, or the creator, can experience and contemplate its own reflection through us. In this scenario specifically, it's done through the two distinct aspects of Harsumptis, the human figure, and his Ba, the serpent. This is a representation of one of the very first lessons esoteric students learn in the mystery schools and in modern Western esoteric organizations, the dual principle, the law of duality in which all creation acquiesces to. That we are dual beings and that everything is dual. You are dual. This is also the principle of polarity of the seven hermetic principles of the Kabbalion. In fact, we can find all seven hermetic principles expressed inside this script, mostly within this relief. For example, the principle of polarity with Har Samatawe and Ra Samatawe, and then we have the two Ka's, which I'll explain in a moment. There's also the principle of mentalism, the idea that all is mind, that we aren't apart from this miraculous source, this creator, and we're merely looking at it from an adequate distance. Instead, we are actually an inherent part of it. There is also the principle of vibration, the idea that nothing rests, everything moves, everything vibrates. With Ihi, the lord of vibration himself, depicted as Harsumptis, as the serpent, this principle is being represented. So, John, you're saying it's a wave? Yeah, 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 this is a wave form. The serpent, the serpent represents one of the reasons why the serpent in the, in the Garden of Eden represents, um, I mean, not only temptation, but represents um, the, the division of the, the primordial scission. The serpent is, is the first wave form. From the lotus flower, we have emanating what looks like sort of an eggplant, which the unicorns think is the cathode ray tube. But I think what it is is the perfume of the of the lotus, the odor of sanctity, sometimes talked of in the church. And if you were a cartoonist, um, how, are you going to, how are you going to draw a smell? You would do it something like this. In the middle of this comes the water snake, which is, Charlotte just talks about, as the first wave form. So it's the, it's the first vibration when, the, when, the, when unity is sundered. Mm -hmm. What is, emerges from that sundering is the wave form, is vibration. In the beginning was the word. There's also the principle of correspondence, the hermetic tradition saying that you're probably most familiar with, as above, so below, as within, so without. This corresponds to the cause and inner and outer aspects expressed in and out of the enveloped odor of sanctity. We also have the principle of rhythm, where everything flows, out and in. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. And that's why we see two light bulbs on the southern wall that essentially come together. Uh, we have the principle of cause and effect. Every cause has its effect. Every effect has its cause. Everything happens according to law. This is the universal law of creation. And we find cause on wall one and the effect on wall two. This is encoded in the architecture itself. Spirit manifests into matter as matter returns to spirit or the source. Now, turn around. Directly opposite is stage two in which we have two eggplants and two people holding it and the serpent is now emanating from it but it's a now acquired finish. It has eyes and a collar, same for this one, mm -hmm. and the 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 jet column here instead of holding holding up the 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 waveform is holding up 
the envelope of fragrance. Same over here. Obviously, this is meaningful. I'm, my interpretation is incorrect. Well, okay, but it's it's certainly a stage two because it's the one, the one is the is the earlier unfinished form, and this one is the finished form. And here, we see that the falcon has acquired feathers, but the feet are left unfinished, and the headdress is left unfinished. In other words, this is. It's cyclical here. It's 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 telling you that becoming is is never is never is, there's no there's no there's no end to it as it were. It's, it's when the, the feathers are there, and but the 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 feet and the crown are still unfinished, and vice versa. On the other side, the whole thing it's only the feathers and the feet aren't even seen there. The the, the headdress is finished. In other words, the principle is there, but the manifestation is not over here. The manifestation is carried out up to a point, but the the and now the principle um, and the and the and the foundation has become potential. And finally, we have the seventh principle of gender. Gender is in everything. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles, its active and passive principles. So we have the male and female principles both expressed here with Harsamatawe or Harsumptis and his mother, Hathor, who we'll talk about more in a moment. We see the same expression in this alchemical image. I'll do another video on this particular image in the future, but we see a man holding the sun. A thousand years from now, people may look back and say, oh, look at this image, man had solar power, but that's not exactly what's being represented here. However, the same principle underlying the law of three, where two opposing forces come together to produce a third, applies to the material world as well as electricity. Think about how an electrical current with its positive phase and negative phase, the one and the two in Pythagorean terms, come together to produce electricity, a third. So while this may not be depicting an actual light bulb, the principle of electricity, that first spark, is what is indeed being expressed here in this relief. Now, keep in mind that these images depicting a man and a serpent are representatives of different energies in the universe, and through familiar images, the ancients could connect. Just like our modern science today, the ancients were challenged with ways to express physics. So again, the dual principle is expressed by two versions or two aspects of Harsumptis as man and as serpent. They're both appearing here at the same time. So it is only appropriate that these two aspects would have two cause. Kneeling beneath the bulb are two cause. For the ancient Egyptians believed the ka was one of nine aspects of the soul. Their view of the ka was that it was an invisible double of the body and represented the life force or living essence of the person. The ka was created at the same time as the living body. The ka lived on after the death of the body. And this is why offerings of food and drink were presented to the mummified bodies, because the ka needed nourishment. But the Ka didn't eat the offerings. The Ka would absorb the energy or essence of the offerings for nourishment. If you are alive, you have a Ka. Ka is your vital essence or life force, and it is only one of nine aspects of your soul, according to the ancient Egyptian point of view. As the vital essence or life force, the Ka draws the line between life and death. When you have Ka, you are alive. At the moment of our birth, when we took our very first inhalation, we accepted the Ka, which was intentionally breathed upon us. The function of the Ka is to connect us with all of our ancestors through the collective unconscious. This is shamanism, and we can connect with that through the way of the Ka. So here we see the invisible Ka made visible, supporting something with obviously potential for life, not a light bulb. Before the two kneeling Ka's, we find Hathor seated. Hathor in her cosmic role as the mistress of cycles of time, the feminine force multiplier of nourishment. She was symbolically attributed to the Milky Way and is often depicted as a cow or female with a bovine head, cow ears, or just the body of a woman. She was the goddess or netter, the energetic principle of love, joy, music, and pleasure.
As we already mentioned, syncretism was a popular way for the ancient Greeks who occupied Egypt. They amalgamated Hathor with Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of pleasure. Hathor is the mistress of the temple of woman, birth, and new life, which is the temple of Dendera. She was the mother of Ihi and therefore Harsumptis, who, like a seaman in an erect phallus, is depicted here as a serpent, the rising sun at the point of creation. She sits before the Jed pillar with arms extended like a car, penetrating the envelope, what my mentor took as a fragrance or a liken to the odor of sanctity in Christianity, which should be a telltale sign that this is not a light bulb or a cathode ray tube or crook's tube. The Jed is often associated with the backbone of Osiris. It's a symbol of strength and stability, representing the four elements needed to support creation itself, earth, air, fire, and water. The Jed is raising the body of Harsumtis, or Ihi, the sun god, represented in relief as a serpent. Essentially, it's the first waveform in an exalted manner of connection and worship. The Jed holds the living Ba for support as to give him stability. It's like a way to give this depiction of the rising sun support and stability for, and to give support and stability to creation itself. Before the Jed is Neha, who represents millions of years. He greets the sun god. He was known to greet the morning sun. He is eternity, or it could also mean millions of years, and is attributed to the celestial cow, and his duty was to lift the solar bark back into the sky, which in the light bulb theory is the bulb, at the end of its nocturnal journey. And it, it's interesting that it's a nocturnal journey because the figure here at the end, some believe is Toth, who has attributions to the moon. The moon is always connected to the netherworld or underworld. So it's appropriate that this is taking place in a crypt below the surface, beneath the surface. In fact, I think there may be a symbolism that is encoded here to express the ancient Egyptians' worldview. We have, it's actually very much similar to the Mesoamericans. You have the underworld, the plane in which we dwell, and then that which we cannot see, that which is above, the heavens, the uh, the afterlife. And so the idea of having Neha here is to express the wish of millions of years of life or rule for the uh, creation of the sun. And ultimately, this is commemorated to the pharaoh. From the symbolist point of view, the very fact that it is oriented in the easternmost of these five crypts, and that's where you find these odd reliefs, it provides us with a clue. A clue that it is geared toward creation as the sun rises in the east. Now, this figure all the way here at the end, we've briefly mentioned him before. It is Upu, at least according to the text. Upu is a mate of Hathor. He was a protector deity of Sumptus, the sun god. And here in the text that the chematologist tells us, uh, reads a knowledge of ancient uh, technology that may be abused, actually says, your name is perfect as Upu. Your face is that of a toad. I have killed your enemies with knives and I fell your opponents at the place of execution. And by fell your opponents just basically means to, to make your opponents fall. In other words, he is saying that he has slayed the opponents. He has slayed the opposing forces. He has cleared the way of negative energies for the sun to rise. That is what this is representing. And this, according to the text, is Upu, although it is a composite because it does look like a baboon because it has the tail. So it could be attributed to Thoth. But we also have this frog face. Now, I happen to think that it may be Keck, and I'd like to make a case for Keck being depicted in the relief inside the crypt here at Dendara. But before we get into that, I just want to point out how this inscription, read top to bottom, is not an explanation of a knowledge of technology that could be abused, as it has been perpetuated by the chematologist in video one of the Street Part series. It's simply saying, I have killed your enemies with knives, and I fell your opponents at the place of execution. This, I believe, is a great example of why we should not blindly accept what we are being told, even if it's by our favorite alternative authors, even if it's something that may resonate with us or feel like something that we want to hear or want to believe in. 
I want to believe too, but don't take my word for it. I'm just here to transmit what I have learned and experienced, and I'd rather you practice discernment and verify for yourself. I'm not saying that all Egyptology is right and exact. It certainly has its flaws, but it's not uncommon for alternative authors to rally up fans against a PhD degreed Egyptologist, making them out to be the enemy as a means to garner support from fans by pitting them against this common enemy as a means to either sell books or tours or what have you. Egyptology is not our enemy, and we actually stand to learn a great deal from this academic discipline. Now, I'm a researcher who likes to look at all of the evidence and follow where the evidence leads. And while this may turn off some of my subscribers who are absolutely sold on alternative theories and convicted that all Egyptologists are a big joke, I would be remiss if I did not say that in total transparency, personally, I find more value in the academic texts than I do from the vast majority of alternative work. But I do think it's important that we lay out all the pieces on the table as Egyptology is not an exact science either. In this case, I agree with the Egyptologist, as well as my mentor, John Anthony West, in that this relief is part of ancient Egyptian mythology and expressing a stage in cosmology, not a light bulb. Although it does convey the same underlying principle of electricity. Proponents of the light bulb theory often neglect the texts that surround the scene, but we know what the inscription says. How do we know? We know what it says thanks to the remarkable work of German Egyptologist and Ptolemaic specialist Wolfgang Watkiss. It's all explained in his dissertation, published as a book in 1997, entitled The Texts in the Lower Crypts of the Hathor Temples of Dendera, Their Statements for the Function and Meaning of These Areas. And according to the Egyptological point of view, the relief is not depicting a light bulb or crook's tube, but rather depicts part of the Egyptian mythology. And I agree. And I am not just blindly deferring to the Ptolemaic experts or simply reading the glyphs and what has already been written on other websites. As a researcher, I think it's important to take due diligence into consideration. In effort to establish a new quality standard, we have to verify what's actually being said. In my research, I looked at what several different Egyptologists had to say spanning across several generations. Further, I worked with fellow researcher and author Dr. Manu Saifzadeh to help assist me with properly translating Wolfgang Wackes' German translation, his work, into English, and even cross-referenced Wackes' transliteration using the Mark Bigas Middle Egyptian Dictionary from 2015, to which I will leave a link for you in the description below. It's a good resource to have for those with a serious interest in further studying. Watkiss tells us that the name or epithet or title of this mysterious frog-headed figure is WPW, Wupu, in the inscription in the two columns just above the figure's head and continued alongside him in the vertical column, reads from top to bottom, your name is perfect as Wupu, your face is that of a toad. I have killed your enemies with knives and I fell your opponents at the place of justified execution. So to summarize, this is not an inscription about a knowledge of technology that could be abused as the chematologist has erroneously told us in video one, which echoes an idea first documented by Eric von Daniken expressing the same idea in different words who told us that it's a warning that a device could be dangerous if not used correctly. But that is not what this inscription in the relief is telling us. The text is not a prophecy warning about the future. The text is clearly a protective statement, which could be considered a protective spell, stating that the principal here, the mystery frog-headed figure, has killed the enemies with knives, making them fall at the scene of execution, which is justified. He is defeating opposing forces to make way for the rising sun. Therefore, the figure is a protector deity of Sumptis or Har Samatawi, the sun god. So, who is this mystery figure? Eric von Doniken refers to him as the baboon, which is one of the forms of Toth, a Greek corruption of the ancient Egyptian Netter Jahuti, the cosmic principle of wisdom, the great initiator. Admittedly, 
the physical frame is reminiscent of a baboon and it does have a tail like a baboon, but nothing in the text mentions Toth by name. So then who is this mysterious character? The inscription in the column above makes reference to WPW, Wupu, whose name or title is perfected, or that could also be taken as beautiful or even realized, whose name or title is realized, a realized man, and whose face is that of a toad, which comes from the inscription in the two columns directly above his head. Here, we can see the glyphs for Wupu on the left, and at the bottom of the right column, we can see what looks like two cups, one with something extended from it, a water ripple glyph, and what looks like a circle with four lines, and the frog beneath it. These are glyphs that are known to the Egyptologists as W10, R7, W24, J1, and L7, which make up the word Abhen, which is a noun that simply means frog. But keep in mind, frog for us is not necessarily frog for the ancient Egyptians. Our concept of frog may simply be an amphibian, whereas for the ancient Egyptians, it may hold a deeper meaning relating to their cosmogony. Just as a water sign is not merely a water sign, but may denote the primordial watery chaos from pre-creation. I think that the frog face of Wupu is an ancient Egyptian allusion to the male aspect of the Ogdwad, which according to the ancient Egyptian Hermopolitan cosmogony, where the eight primordial deities that existed in four pairs of male and female, which by the way, is another expression of the hermetic principle of gender, where each pair of male and female aspects are associated with specific aspects of pre-creation. For example, you have Nun and Nunet, which represent water, He and Hohet, personifying infinity. Then we have Kek and Koket, which is darkness, Amun and Amunet, the hidden. And so I agree with my mentor, John Anthony West, who in video two of this series talks about how he interprets this particular relief as being a place before creation. Because the Agwad were the original elements that were believed to be inert, that is to say, before creation, yet they contain the potential for creation. They contain the seed for creation. They were the mothers and fathers of the sun god. And who is the dominant figure portrayed in this relief? If you said Harasamatawi or Hasumptis or even Ihi, you are correct. And you have been paying attention, which means I've been doing my job. The four male aspects complement the four female aspects. Four is a number often attributed to the material world, to substance, to physical things. Symbolically speaking, it is a number associated with organization and order. Order is what comes from chaos, such as the primordial chaos where the Ogdwad would dwell before all creation. With four points, we can create the square or a cross, something we can't do with two or three. If you want to learn more about Pythagorean number mysticism, I will be uploading a lesson to my private membership site, ancientegyptmysteryschools.com, where you can join for a small fee. It's a one-time non-recurring fee that helps to support my work. And it's simply Ancient Egypt Mystery Schools. Dot com, but I will leave a link in the description below for those of you who may be interested in becoming a member and taking a deeper dive. The cross is an intersection between points, between two worlds, and often represents a portal. We have the four cardinal directions. In Mesoamerican traditions, for example, the ancient Maya, at the center of this was a world tree. I talked about this during my presentation at the 2019 CPAC conference on procession and ancient knowledge. You can find that presentation entitled The Esoteric Wisdom and Sacred Science of the Ancient Maya Mystery Schools right here on my YouTube channel. We also have four elements, earth, air, water, fire, which each of the four pairs of the Agwad sort of represented. The the curious thing about the Agduad is that the female aspects would take the form of a serpent-headed deity, whereas the male aspects could take the form of a frog-headed deity. So I think the frog head is an allusion to the male aspect of the Agduad. The WP in Wupu means to open, like the function of Wapuwet, who was the opener of the way. 
this would be appropriate as the frog-headed figure is slaying all the enemies for Harsumptis or Harsimatui, killing the opposing forces to make way for the rising sun, personified by the sun god. It's unclear to me exactly how the German Egyptologist Wolfgang Watkiss translates his transliteration of WPW, but according to the Vigus Egyptian Dictionary, it can also be linked to the Opet, which is a festival and attributed to the lotus flower, which gives birth to the sun god. So we have the opening and festival, but it could also mean to judge. And again, we know from the inscription beside the figure that he had to judge who the enemies were in order to slay them. He judges with two knives to execute his enemies. So Wupu also means to judge, as well as to cut up and divide. It could also mean the double knives. Wupu could also mean to join, as in joining of light and dark joining of night into day, and even joining of the two lands, just as Har Samatawi is the unifier of the two lands, Upper and Lower Egypt. So everything about the language being used here is amplifying the theme of the Hermopolitan cosmogony of the ancient Egyptians. And we talked a bit about syncretism in ancient Egypt, especially becoming popular in Ptolemaic times. One of the reasons for this is because the Ptolemaic Greeks, who were ruling over Egypt at the time, were viewed with hostility by many. And so they needed to pander or satisfy the locals to keep them at bay. They built temples in the style and tradition of the native Egyptians, but depicted themselves next to the gods. In this way, the Greeks could give the people what they wanted in terms of temple tradition, while also promoting their own propaganda to seed the mindset of the native Egyptians. So they amalgamated the different cosmogonies into one coherent theme. That is what we may be seeing here. It may be a fusion or a composite principle. I think the figure is one, or even perhaps all of the primordial ones, an allusion to the Agduad. But given that we have the face of a frog, it's likely a male aspect. That said, if we were to get more specific, again, I think it's Kek from the Agduad pair of Kek and Quaket, who represented not only darkness, but that transitional point between light and dark, day and night, like a Kid Cudi song. Kek was the frog-headed male aspect of the Agduad, who was the bringer of light. He was the personification of darkness into light, from the moon to the sun. We talked about the frog, and the word for that is abchen, which also means a light and a uniter. We have to take into consideration the characteristics of what's being depicted here. In this case, a frog. And what do we know about a frog? The frog is both a amphibian creature of the water so the primordial watery abyss and the land. In other words, it can move between the two, the water and the land. And so from the point of view of the symbolist, it represents a transitional state. The ancient Egyptians believed in a state before creation, the primordial watery abyss of chaos, where the Agduad dwelled. So here we have the opener of the way, Wupu, making the judgment to slay enemies, allowing the sun, personified by the sun god, Harsumptis or Harsamatawi, to keep rising perpetually from darkness into light, from night into day, the transitional state from the moon to the sun, symbolizing creation made manifest from pre-creation. So this is why I think it's depicting Kek. This, of course, is open to your own interpretation. And please do let me know in the comments below who you think this figure may be depicting. This is who I think it represents. Again, this is my own insight. And I'm not making the mistake of forming a hard opinion here either, because I think it also has potential to be Heket. There is also good evidence to support this. Hekwet was the female frog-headed consort of Kanum who was the male principal that fashioned men, including Ihi, on the potter's wheel. Here is a relief taken from the Mimisi, just outside the temple within the complex of Dendera. We can clearly see Ihi on the potter's wheel, between Kanum, the ram-headed god, and Hekwet, the frog-headed goddess. Hekwet was a netter of fertility and associated with Hathor. So it would be appropriate to find her inside the crypt in a Hathor temple especially given that this mystery figure is preceding a scene of creation. 
in the crypt, the underworld, the womb, before creation, inside a temple consecrated to woman, to the womb and cycles and birth. And here in the crypt is where the instruments were kept that were used in the festival to celebrate the birth of a new year celebration. I have put exhaustive research into this searching far and wide, and I just haven't come across enough hard evidence to firmly conclude on this composite figure. It could also be a composite with aspects of Toth because of the baboon form and tail as we have discussed, but this can also easily be countered with this relief, which shows Keck with a tail, further cementing my theory that it's Keck who was depicted in the crypt. In the interest of fairness, it could be a composite with Toth aspects. Toth is attributed to the moon. We have an interplay between darkness of night and light of day. Toth played an illustrious role in the Hermopolitan cosmogony. In the epic battle of Horus and Set, both feuding parties sought audience with Toth. And in the Book of the Dead, which is best viewed as the book of coming forth by day, Toth is in the judgment scene. He proceeded over the weighing of the heart ceremony as a judge. And we know how Wupu can be attributed to judge. Look here, we can see the cattle horn that makes up the word WP, meaning to open, where we get the word Wupu from, which is reminiscent of the scale in the judgment scene. Judgment was certainly an aspect of Toth, who again was part of the Hermopolitan cosmogony that's expressed here. And of course, the figure has the tail of a baboon, but the tail alone is not a good way to determine a figure, its identity, because even kings wore tails. There would be kings that would wear the bull's tail during the said festival initiation rites. So it's possible that this is merely Keck wearing the tail of a baboon for similar reasons. So to conclude on the case of the mysterious frog-headed character, I lean toward the idea that this is Keck, razor up of the night, abolishing all opposing forces in order to clear the way for the birth of the rising sun, most likely on New Year's Day, as that is when this was celebrated here. However, it may also be Hekwet or Toth, uh, even a composite where Keck is part of it. Hekwet is part of it and Toth is part of it, all combined into one. We don't don't have to settle on any one idea. In any event, whatever the case is, the ancient Egyptians are telling us that this relief is depicting a complex creation event with different natural forces involved. And we don't have to settle on one force or another nature. We just need to infer that it's all about pre-creation. We don't have to decide whether it was a composite effort in pandering or if it has a deeper metaphysical aspect to it. The ancient Egyptians had a sense of spatial awareness and a very, very complex ontology or worldview where one thing that we may see may hold many meanings. 2,000 years from now, future archaeologists may dig up our retail shopping centers and they may determine that they were ceremonial plazas where rituals were carried out. But we see them today as a place where we can go to buy electronics or food or clothing or do our banking, etc., etc. It's one plaza that represents different aspects of human activity. Intuitively, I feel like it's Keck, but I think there is a solid case to be made for Hekwet and Toth, as well as a composite of the entire Ogdwad. I also think it's possible that there was a physical statue of Harsumptis, Harsumatawi, emerging from the lotus flower as a serpent that was used in the ceremonial festival that took place here at the temple, stored here in the crypt. We find descriptions of the instruments that are kept in the crypts, explaining how things were made of gold, even giving us numbers and measures. I also think that the investigation into this mystery character and the accompanying text and what's been said by alternative authors about it is a good example of why we shouldn't blindly accept what we are told, even, again, when it's from our favorite authors. We should always try to practice discernment and follow the evidence. We shouldn't get stuck on one track or train of thought, but rather look at many different pieces as possible, and this includes deferring to what has been written in academic texts. 
because Egyptology is a good place to start when studying Egypt. I say this because many who follow alternative authors that bash the discipline simply take what they are told as gospel without verifying for themselves. If you're not proficient in reading Ptolemaic hieroglyphs, you may believe what you're being told if you don't question that. And you may not question it if it feels right to you, but I say question everything, even me. I encourage you to go out and find the answers for yourself. And to be fair, we do need to look at the Egyptological point of view. The Egyptologists are telling us that the temple was consecrated to Hathor and festivals were celebrated here. It's obvious from the reliefs that ceremonial rites were carried out by the ancient priesthood and the crypt was used to store various instruments and paraphernalia associated with the festival, including the New Year's festival. Egyptologist Francois Dumas explains the following, and I quote, In the last room, one sees carefully carved on the southern wall a falcon with detailed feathers, preceded by a snake emerging from a lotus blossom within a boat. Whereas the whole of the temple is constructed of sandstone to facilitate a relief of fine quality, there was placed in the wall at the level of the figures a block of limestone suitable for very detailed work, and of this the artist took full and perfect advantage. These reliefs are cosmological representations. The snake that comes out of the lotus is equated with the shining deity Harasamatawi, or Ihi, as he appears for the first time out of the primordial sea. He is again represented near the bottom of the crypt in the form of two snakes also coming forth, but this time wrapped in lotuses like protective envelopes. Sometimes those that were on the Mesktek bark collaborated with Horus. Other times, the Manjet bark with its crew helped to reveal the god. Jed raised his body, a supreme manner of worship, attendant of the god's prestigious Ka. The statues appear to have been used for the New Year celebration and the festival of Harasamatawi. It is likely that on these solemn occasions, these objects were transported to the vault, which is the room above the crypt. End quote. The Egyptologist believes that it was from the easternmost part of the southern crypts that the sacred procession began on the eve of the first day of the new year, with the images of the goddess from the subterranean room, just as the created world rose from the abyss of the first day. And so it's safe to conclude that the inscriptions represented the myth which was being celebrated here. Another Egyptologist, E.A. Wallace Budge, tells us that Harasematawi, son of Hathor, here takes the form of a serpent. He also appears as a hawk. It was, and I quote, in this form, Horus was believed to have sprung into existence out of a lotus flower, which blossomed in the heavenly abyss of Nu at dawn, at the beginning of the new year, end quote. And so this relief of a serpent inside of what appears to be a bubble is a representation of the universe out of nothingness. It's the emergence of the sun god from the lotus flower, and we see other examples of it throughout the temple. Also, Sylvie Corville, who worked extensively on the inscriptions in the Dendera Temple, suggested that the carvings are Harasematawi, or Harsumptis, Horus, the unifier of two lands, and is depicted as a serpent, a falcon, and as a child, Ihi, the son of Hathor, and Horus. So there you have it from the Egyptologist. Now, before we conclude, we're going to take a look at the opposing wall, the southern wall, where we find two light bulbs. And I'm going to read you the translation of the Ptolemaic hieroglyphs that are depicted just above the scene that explain the scene. So we are now facing south, taking a look at the southern wall. Let us slide to the right at one of these panels before the so-called light bulbs, where we see Harsumptis or Harsumatawi depicted in the form of a falcon. And we also see Harsumptis as the serpent, which is coming up or emerging from the lotus blossom. We can also see that he, the lotus is on top of the solar bark, and that is not obviously not a core to a light bulb, as the proponents of the light bulb theory would have you think. Uh, just up above, the two columns above the serpent... Starting, starting from the column to the right, reading top to bottom. Uh, the reason why we read from the right, if you look at the image of Horus as, as the falcon here, we can see that it is facing the right. So in reading hieroglyphs, if something is facing the right, you read it from right to left. If the figures are facing left, you would read it from left to 
to right. You always read into the face of the figure. So we're starting at the column all the way to the right at the top, top to bottom. It says, words spoken by Har, Sumptis, uniter of the two lands, the great god who resides in Inetaneter, Lunet, which is central Dendera. And here it gives a description as being gold with a height of four hands. The day solar bark is made of metal, the lotus flower made of gold. This is why I think that this was actually what the statue looked like. There was actually a, a serpent emerging from a lotus statue on a solar bark that was likely part of the paraphernalia and equipment that was stored here in the crypt and used for the festival celebration. To the left of that, we have the panel above to, to the right and above the falcon, which reads, words spoken by Harsumthus, uniter of two lands, the great god who resides in central Dendera, the multicolored feathered, one who is on the Sarak, which is described here as gold with a height of one cubit. And behind the falcon, it says, words spoken by Ihi, the great, the son of Het Heru, Ra in its form of the great god who appears with the diadem as a king of Egypt and as the master of the said festival. You reign over Dendera for millions of years, for all eternity, to the completion of the Jed, eternity. And this is described as being gold with a height of one cubit. Now, if we move all the way to the southern end of this wall, where we have the two so-called light bulbs, we can see above that there is two sets of inscriptions. And we're going to start with the set on the right, which reads, words spoken by Har Sematawi, the great who resides in Dendera, the living Ba in the lotus flower of the day solar bark whose perfection with two arms of the Jed Pillar carries its image while the cause on its knees are with bent arms. And this is described as being made of gold and all precious stones. And it has a height of three hands. I don't know any light bulbs that are made of gold with precious stones. So again, I assume that this is part of the statuary that was used in the ceremony. Now, the inscription on the left reads, words spoken by Har Samatawi, the great who resides in Dendera, who is in the arms of the princes in the night solar bark, the noble snake whose statue is carried by Heh, whose Ka carries his realized perfected self in, in the divinity or sacredness because of whose Ba, is appearing in the sky, whose shape is admired by admirers, who comes as unique, enveloped by his serpents, with numerous names in the land of Atum, the father of the gods who created everything. This is described here as being made of gold, metal, and has a height of four hands. Now, what I find interesting is that the inscriptions on the right, they're, they're very similar, and the inscriptions on the right include the day solar bark in the formula, where the inscriptions on the left include the night solar bark in the formula. So we have the moon and the sun, night and day, that interplay between the two, which is essentially a way of giving birth to the day, to the rising sun, that point at dawn. Also, in a deeper cosmological sense, like we see on the opposing wall, represented by what I think is Keck, this, is, this stems back all the way to pre-creation, the primordial beginning. Pre-creation, giving birth to what is made manifest. And that is what is being celebrated here in the festival at Dendera, which celebrates the new year, the birth of the new year. Now, you may already know all of this, or maybe you learned a little something. If you have learned anything at all, drop a comment in the comment section below and let me know. I always enjoy reviewing the comments and exchanging open-minded dialogue with everyone. So if you have any interpretations of your own, please let me know. If you have any questions that you'd like me to further explain, I'll be happy to do so if I have time in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like, please subscribe, and make sure you hit that bell icon so that you can get future updates on forthcoming videos so that I could get early views 
views so that we could signal YouTube's algorithm so that hopefully YouTube will start to show my videos to more people because I do think with my years of experience and you know the knowledge that I'm sharing with everyone I, I do think others will find value in this but I need your help I need your help sharing the video to spread the word this isn't just my channel this is our channel and so with that being said uh, if you do want to support the channel you can join my paid membership section at ancientegyptmysteryschools.com or you can also get exclusive content at my Patreon. I'll leave a link for that in the comments below as well. Uh, that's about it for this one. I will see you in the next video. Until next time, this is NEXT signing off.